Um, I'm James Taylor. <coughs> Jim Young. Um, yeah, it's push forward. So we are. Um, I was going to time it to make sure it didn't go over, but I won't. So um, we're a two-part, or partly because it's so hot in here, I tend to be like, which is the eastern melt into the ground after about ten minutes. So um, I'll do ten minutes, and I'll hand over to Jenny, who's really the brains. Wait, a can you hear me without the microphone? Or yeah, is that okay? I tend to walk. I apologise. I'm a walker, like the Walking Dead. Um, I'll do about ten minutes, and then I'll hand over to Jenny. I'm doing kind of like the history stuff. So a starter for me, a really useful starter for me is. Um, before we even go down the road of what we're talking about, who knows about aces? And I don't mean the playing cards. One or two of you, okay, that's good. But I didn't want this to be a revision lesson for a lot of you. I'm going to do kind of like a history lesson, if you like, uh, and it's the bit with the graphs, okay? So I apologise in advance for the graphs. Then I'll hand you over to Jenny who will do the important stuff about what it actually means and where we go. Is that okay? We'll try and do this in... Ten minutes. Um, we also equally could have called this, um, um, it's often not enough just to smile at your baby. It helps, but it's only a starting point. But, um, and that's kind of a reference to a conversation I had with someone about 15, 20 years ago about what we should be doing more about up, uh, up, upstreaming, like working with children to make sure that they're um, uh, leading healthy lives in the future. So what we're talking about here. Well, the important factor, first and foremost, is that we're actually talking about trauma. ACEs is, is, is related to the notion of trauma. And trauma has no boundaries. It doesn't sit in any one particular place. It can affect anybody and, in some cases, everybody. And some of the data will show you some inter interesting findings on that. So it doesn't it matter if you're 5 or 65? It doesn't it matter if you're rich? It doesn't it matter if you're poor? Um, it doesn't matter if you live... Uh, in many respects in sub-Saharan Africa or live in the Arctic or live in an affluent westernised society. It doesn't matter if you vote Conservative, Labour, Socialist Party, Lib Dem, it makes no difference. The reality is, is it knows no boundaries. It's an impact because of that. So this brings us to the concept of the ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experience. Now, you would think common sense would tell you, yeah, let's look after our children and their futures will be healthy. But bizarrely enough, for a long, long time, I think we've taken it kind of for granted. Nobody really looked at it properly. And then up steps this chap, Vincent Fellini. Eh, Felitti. Fellini's the actor, the director. Vincent Felitti. Now, what's really interesting is this guy uh, is a therapist of some description, and he works with obesity. And he's wondering why there's so many people dropping out of his, his, his case lodge when he's working with them. Why do I have such a large dropout? Now, my time as a psychotherapist, I used to always say it's because they're not ready for therapy. It's their fault. There's never something else going on. He decided to do something about it and have a look. And what he actually found was some quite interesting features about people's early life experiences that all seemed to be related to what was going on with their dropout rates. So he took this to the CDC, the Centre for Disease Council in America. And uh, Robert Anda was really interested in this. And the pair of them got together and started what actually has become quite a large set of research data. Kind of the back end of the 1990s, 97 right through to kind of 98 was the, was the kind of a first and second waves, and it's really ongoing. Which is why I asked the question at the start, who knows about ACEs? Because this is actually not new now. It is the best part of nearly 20 years old. But it seems to only just recently start filtering across. So what does it do? Well, they started looking at about 17,000 people who were attached to um, uh, Valiti's uh, um, uh, 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 service. And we're looking at these people. And they found a number of things. Um, pretty much they conducted a health exam, actually. Uh, and some question is about what their lives were like. And what they kind of looked at was mostly males, to be honest. Um, mostly white. I'm saying mostly males. Uh, and people were kind of in their 50s. So they found these people, sat down and looked at them. And what they kind of found was a whole raft of problems and difficulties and challenges going on in their life, which I'll come on to in a second. But in reality, what they kind of found out was there was something quite profound going on, and they formed this pyramid. And may respect this pyramid is probably too early in the presentation, but I want to come back to it later on. They formed this pyramid, which basically said here, 
is that if you're exposed to some really nasty experiences in early life, uh, and, and kind of group by three factors, uh, some form of abuse, physical, emotional, sexual, some sort of form of household dysfunction, uh, uh, somebody in the house drinking, somebody in the house with mental health problems, somebody in the house in contact with criminal justice, and some form of exposure to neglect, that was classified as some childhood experience. They were saying as a precursor to actually, in many respects, early death. Early death. So they published this quite groundbreaking uh, paper, and it's out there, you can go and look at it and read it for yourself, but I'm going to give some of the, the initial overview data for it. So what do we know? Well, actually, I said at the start about trauma knowing no barriers. In this last population we looked at, um, uh, more than 50% actually had an ACE, had at least one thing, one traumatic event in early childhood. Uh, but what they also found is, even though we had these ACEs, actually, they weren't that well recognised. People parked them. People parked them. In fact, philetius has got a really, really interesting quote in a, a much later paper when he says, time doesn't heal, time conceals. People parked them down, and they weren't visible. And often they were concealed largely because we've got things like shame and secrecy, and it's my life, I don't want to share it, and there's some social taboos. You don't talk about what happened to your family or in your house when you're younger. But what they found out with these things is actually, by and large, these adverse experiences people were, were uh, reporting in their early lives were really strong predictors for later life adult disease. Physical illness, mental illness, chronic disease processes, and in some cases leading to early death. Now, what's missing from this slide, actually, because it's condensed down, is there's another notion at the bottom. It's actually, what they said was, this is a public health issue, a very robust, profound public health problem. That what we've got here is people who develop solutions later in life that help them cope with the challenges they experienced in early life. They were adaptive for those individuals, but actually, in the broader concept of public health, they were causing problems for them. So when you start looking at the, the data itself, what we're talking about here, actually, I just jumped out of line a little bit. I apologise for that. Uh, uh, in terms of exposure, about 20%, one in five, were exposed to some form of, of sexual abuse. About a third, just under a third, physical abuse, emotional abuse by parents, roughly one in ten. Neglect was fairly common, at about 15% for emotional neglect, and about 10% for physical neglect. And then we start looking at household dysfunction. Remember one of the, what's the third of the three categories? I'll come back to one because it's jumped across. About 27% actually were living in a household in early childhood years where substance misuse was an issue. And about 20% where mental illness was present within the household. And again, when you start looking at exposure to domestic abuse or domestic violence in the house, that was also present in about 12% of the population they looked at. Um, then you look at uh, grief, parental loss, uh, which again is about 20%. And a small number, a very small number, about 5%, were exposed to criminal justice services. What's really interesting is that, by and large, actually, these numbers have been fairly consistent and a lot of studies repeated after it. Slight variations up or down, but they're roughly 50 to 80% exposed to at least one ACE. They've been fairly consistent with all the studies since then. And when you start looking and breaking it down bit by bit, and I'm going to very quickly just skip through these, what it's telling you here is actually when you look at adverse childhood experiences and compare them with certain disease processes or illnesses or social challenges, you'll see that if you've got six or more adverse childhood experiences earlier on, actually, your chances of being a smoker are much, much higher. Of course, if you know you still smoke, there's still a risk of smoking, but it's much, much higher. Percentage is up to about uh, 18%. Alcoholism, again, an ace of four or more, the childhood uh, adverse experience scale, about 16% of those with four or more, again, had problems with adult alcoholism. Intravenous drug use, again, it's a percentage score. People with four or more adverse childhood experiences, so it's a bit of neglect, uh, some form of abuse, and some form of household dysfunction. Again, percentage-wise, higher risk of being exposed to um, uh, intravenous drug use. 
And it goes on and on. We start looking at promiscuity. There's a strong relationship with promiscuity. Again, four or more, you are three and a bit times more likely to be exposed to more than 50 sexual partners. That's also the case we start looking at early teenage pregnancy. Being uh, pregnant before the age of 15, it's also related to males getting teenagers pregnant. Multiple ACEs. And we start looking at sexually transmitted diseases. Again, if you've got a high number of ACEs, you're about two and a half times more likely, to, uh, in Felicity's uh, Russell Week research, to be in contact with sexually transmitted disease. I'm only going to quickly just summarise this part, because really what we're saying, this is actually, the title's a bit of a, an error. This slide's from the Family Policy Institute of Washington. And what they're basically saying here is that there's something goes on in early life, right? Critical sensitive time development things, growing up as a child. But there's also aspects of experience. So the challenges of being exposed to trauma. And then there's this notion of genetics, or what they actually call epigenetics. The things that happen out with the DNA, but that happen at genetic level. They can actually transfer across from mother to child going on. And that influences development, brain development. It influences our chemical and our, our, our molecular development, which then hardwires the brain, which in many respects leads to these later life challenges. And I said I'm going to come back to the pyramid, because that's what we've found in maybe the last 20 years. This is from uh, a, a study in America, Rice. Um, it's two years ago, I think, 2015, last year. If they thought there is no pyramid, probably wasn't accurate. It was missing things. And they're saying here, probably what we need to be looking at a bit more is, if you like, the uh, notion of historical trauma and social context where people are living. And that then leads to this notion of trauma and ACEs. Rather than just saying we get an adverse experience, social and emotional difficulties, uh, health risk behaviours, and then disease, and then early death. I'm going to leave you with Jenny now uh, to finish this off. Thanks very much. There's loads and loads of statistics in there and lots of stuff to try and get your head around. Um, once you get ACEs, and once I got ACEs, once that penny drops, ACEs make sense of everything. And I think one of the most important things that we, we work with um, in some of the work that we're doing, I'm one of the therapists at NHS Force Valley Trauma Clinic, um, and I work at Stirling University on the undergraduate student nurse programme um, and postgrad uh, level as well. And it's about this that trauma, trauma is not a diagnosis, trauma is a context. And within the context of trauma, what happened to somebody in their early life, and I've probably just skipped about four of my slides by just that whole wee set, that <coughs> bunch of sentences there. When we look at <coughs> the impact across the lifespan, so why are we here today? Why are we at a drugs conference, the Scottish Drugs Forum? talking to you about ACEs. And like you said earlier, the, f the silos that we used to work in. So I worked in the trauma <coughs> clinic, and we, don't, we used to not see people that were in drugs and alcohol services because they were in addiction services. So we soon, well, eventually got with the programme and thought, you know, maybe we need to be starting doing much more joined <coughs> up work. Maybe we need to be starting to see some of the behaviours that people do as solutions to the background that they've come from some of the exposures that they've had, and some of the reasons why they maintain some of those very harmful behaviours. And unless we can get, engage in a dialogue around some of those, that context of trauma, why do you do what you do when it has the impact and when it has the cost that it has for you, why do you continue to do what you do? And the answer lies in looking at some of the ACE signs. I'm not going to labour the slide as, as such. I, I apologise for the slides, and we didn't get here in time to do a kind of check of the slides before, but they haven't quite loaded properly, some of them, but I'm sure on the website that will be available um, to you. i put this slide up, though, because this is a very, very good slide for looking at the impact of ACEs. If you have six ACEs or more, the original ACE studies looked at ten questions. The maximum ACE score you could get was ten. You had three questions in abuse, you had two in neglect, and the rest were in household dysfunction. ACEs are extremely easy to accumulate. All of us probably in this room at least know somebody, and very probably most of us in this room have at least one ACE. That's just sometimes part of life. 
they're across the field, they're across the spectrum, but what we do know is that ACEs have a dose response. The more you have, the more harm is wreaked and the more impact across the lifespan. And for a young male with an ACE score of six, so he just needs six ACEs, so that may well have been the two in the neglect category, it may have been three or four, like in the household dysfunction category, it may have been one of the abuse ones, such as emotional abuse, physical abuse, and all of a sudden he's got an ACE score of six. That makes him 4,600% more likely to be an IV drug user. I'll just leave that there, because that's a phenomenally large figure. And when you think of some of the young people that you work with, and some of the services that we've come across, and some of the barriers that we meet in terms of trying to move people out of addictions, and move people out of harmful behaviours, and, and their frustration sometimes when their harm reduction programmes don't work, <coughs> We're dealing with the problem that the person is using as a solution to some of the stuff that they did early, that they were exposed to earlier on. This is a slide in relation to dose response, and again, I'm not going to labour because I'm very, very conscious of time on it. But the dose response is directly correlated with the impact on health, and that is in terms of physiological health. The epidemiologists on the original ACE study when they took it to the Centre for Disease Control in America um, almost laid an egg at the level of actual correlation um, that they had with some of the, the uh, diseases such as heart disease, lung disease, respiratory disease, cancers. ACEs are implicated in the top 10 leading causes of death in America. There is a whole movement around ACEs. There's a very good um, website that I would certainly encourage you to look at um, called the ACE Connection Network. Um, and we're slowly in this country starting to get with the programme, some of the work that we're doing at Stirling, some of the very good work that's quite exciting in terms of its development around the Glasgow Centre for Population Health and what is going to maybe be coming out of that stuff. So there are pockets of practice and I would encourage you to have ACE conversations. This was in <coughs> relation to um, when they asked um, when they asked some of the population um, in the Welsh study um, in relation to um, HIV, their, their self-reported risk of exposure to HIV. So what were the harmful behaviours, the health harmful behaviours that they were indulging in or exposed to um, that made them more risky for um, HIV? And the, the study looked at the highest recorded rate was in those who had an A score of 6, 7 or 8. Not hugely surprising that the correlent behaviours exposed them at a much higher risk of sexually transmitted diseases generally and HIV specifically. Similarly with those, and I'm just going to peek past those, this is the Welsh study and I would very much encourage you to have a look at the Welsh study. It's an excellent paper and it's very, very, very readable. It has lovely wee pictures and I do much better with pictures than I do with words half the time. So when you look at what was the actual exposure level, and this is on the uh, <coughs> abuse level and on the household dysfunction, there's a very high level. This study in Wales took place with just over 2,000 people and it, it does stand up as a population study. There's just over 2,000 people it took place and of those, 47% had one or more ACE. When they went down the age scale, however, that figure actually rose. The ACE study across um, the population was over the 2,000 people, but when they actually reduced um, the age scale from 18 to 69 down to 18 to 25, actually the ages <coughs> were above 50%. That may well be to do with, and there'll be people in very much higher pay grades than me and doing very much more like kind of social policy research things. I would argue maybe there are you know, some issues around austerity policies, welfare reform, that type of thing, poverty issues, impacts, and some of the household dysfunction, stuff that we may have seen. The slide at the top um, looks at, again, this is from the Welsh study, um, and if you look at um, an ascending rate there, you can see that actually you're six times more likely, if you've got four or more ACEs, now four ACEs is very achievable, it's very easy to get four ACEs, <coughs> then you're much more likely to have had intercourse under the age of 16. When we think of some of the sexual vulnerability factors of young people, if you're grown up in a household with high dysfunction, <coughs> There maybe aren't boundaries, there's maybe lots of abuse, there's maybe some issues around what are normal and safe sexual practices, sexual boundaries. How do I know what's okay and what's not okay? Some of that stuff has a direct impact in terms of like the sexual proclivities 
uh, young people in some of the very risky situations that they get involved in. If you're not in a situation in a household that will teach you about safe sex, about safe practice, about keeping yourself safe, then how do you find out what you don't know? If you're one of those children who are excluded from school so you don't go through all of that lovely kind of social uh, education uh, um, pathways because you're socially excluded, you're, you're educationally excluded, where do you get your information? You get your information on the street with some of the behaviours and the patterns that you find yourself in the traps that you very early find yourself falling into. And we need to bear in mind that a lot of this is in relation to developing brains. So the brain damage that's actually caused by ACEs is extremely high. And we need to bear that in mind when we're working with young people around sexual practice, around trying to educate them around risk and maybe some of like their substance misuse. At all times, and I'm going to actually probably just finish up this slide because I'm hugely conscious of your, uh, your time. Um, my very big drive and, and our paradigm shift, if you like, in terms of educating mental health nurses is to get away from diagnosis, to move out of that silo and actually start asking people, what happened to you long before you say what's wrong with you? The what's wrong with them is what we categorise as a problem that the person may be using as a solution to work with some of the stuff that they've got going on inside themselves. It becomes a very big integrator. And when you sit down and you start having ACE conversations with people, you're working on a different paradigm. The discourse that you're having is not about the, can you use less, can you use safer, can you use um, in a more refined way. Actually, what happened to you? Let's go there. Let's get the safety and stabilisation factors in place around that stuff before we try and work around some of the, the very difficult behaviours that may be taking place. And harm reduction is always a good idea, but can we do harm redu reduction in a different way? Can we reduce the harm of some of the ACEs that some people have been exposed to? <coughs> this is a um, kind of favourite of mine, if you like, as well. Do no harm. We don't, none of us are in the field that we're in to do harm, we, I would imagine generally think of yourselves as good guys and very much avoid any harem increase. But do we really know harem? And when you know harem, know the harem that ACEs have done. Know the harem that trying to take away coping strategies and protective factors that people use as part of themselves can do. Becoming trauma-informed will never cause harem. Not being trauma-informed might. And I would encourage you all to take that forward and become much more trauma-informed in your practice. And especially when we're working with young people in Macy's, the secret and the changes <coughs> will happen the earlier we intervene and the more eloquently we intervene in that discourse around what happened to you. And this is a favourite lady of mine who um, has educated me endlessly, a lady who has an ASCO to 10. Um, and I've left out the sweary bits um, simply because I'm at a conference, but there were lots of sweary bits and there have been. So basically her whole tenet in terms of anybody that she's working with is walk a mile in my shoes and tell me your feet don't have blisters. And that brings us right back to the first slide, how to climb a mountain with flip-flops on. Yes, you'll get there, but your feet are going to hurt a hell of a lot. You're going to slide and the people in front of you are going to be so far ahead if they were finished with walking boots and poles. But they will get there. It's just about how do we change the footwear and how do we help somebody get to the top of their mountain. Thanks very much. Thank you.